Welcome to Finite Element Methods. Today we'll be discussing the two-dimensional plane stress, plane strain elements. So that's a simplification from 3D. And that's convenient. If we can model things as 2D, it will save us computational time. Uh, in two-dimensional elements, uh, we only have two equilibrium equations. And the only stresses of concern are sigma xx, sigma xy, and sigma yy. This is a lot simpler because now the equilibrium equations look a lot simpler. The differential operator is even simpler. I was using L bold earlier in the previous lecture. We'll use partial this time. You can see the first row times that column uh, gives you the first equation. The second row times that first column gives you that second equation and so forth. The three strain deflection relationships are provided here. You can see that the first column times the First row times that first column gives me the strain and so forth. You can see that this differential operator is the same one as that one, but is the transpose. We already discussed this. The only unknowns for 2D are just two deflections at every node. And the strains are basically partial of U respect to X, just like we had before. Uh, epsilon yy is just partial of v with respect to y and partial xy, uh, which is a shear, is partial of u with respect to y and plus partial of v with respect to x. Very simple. The three equations in Hooke's law is sigma bold equals c bold times strain bold. C bold is this quantity here for plain stress. And in, in these cases for plain stress, what we're talking about here is thin structures. Uh, and for plane strain, the constitutive law that goes in here is slightly different. And that's meant for situations where the transverse strains are zero. So what is the approach we wanna use? We have three governing equations. We can write them in a very compact manner. Uh, actually it's two governing equations, which can be written because there's only two of them, one, two. And there's only two unknown, U and V. So I'm ready here to plug in, just like I had before, sigma bold is C bold times epsilon bold. And epsilon bold is L bold times U bold. We got that from here. And again, here I'm using partial, here I'm using L bold, but they're the same thing. Uh, and I'm ready now to plug it in. So sigma bold is CL bold U bold. I can plug this in here. And now I have my two equations. Two unknowns are UV. I can apply the boundary conditions. Uh, part of the boundary apply uh, the deflections and part of the boundary apply the tractions. Similar process. The types of elements we're talking about here is plane stress and plane stress strain. Axisymmetric elements will be discussed in the very next lecture. In, in a future lecture, I apologize. Plane stress is a good assumption when the structure is thin um, to the plate. The loading is usually in the plane of the 2D plate and the through thickness stresses are negligible. So it's so thin that through thickness stresses don't matter. C bold, the constitutive law is written in this manner for those cases. In plane strain assumption, the loading is only in the 2D plane again. The 2D planes are far, is far both ends. Every 2D section looks exactly the same. So take a very long pipe. Uh, we're, if we're modeling the cross section of that pipe and applying loads to that pipe cross section, that's what we're talking about being plane strain. That 2D plane is so long in one direction that every cross section behaves the same. The structure does not behave like a beam. The supports are the same along the length. The ends do not move axially, bend or twist. Uh, now, Abacus does have a formulation that allows um, something called the generalized plane strain. And each section can move axially, bend and twist. That can happen. Instead of deriving the equations from the total potential energy, we can derive it using the weak form. So. Earlier, when I did a 3D formulation, that was in a previous lecture, in the 3D formulation, I used the total potential energy. But to illustrate that you can actually uh, basically derive the equations using the weak form Galerkin, I think we should try that. And so I did that here to kind of drive the, 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 the 
a different way of doing it, but gives you the same answer. Uh, I'll take then the uh, partial differential equation for the problem. Remember, L bold here is the differential operator here, given on the right. Uh, so if you multiply everything out, you will get two differential equations are highly coupled. I'll bring this whole thing to the right-hand side. So I get this expression. So that's a residual error. I'll take this residual error, multiplied by V, which is a weight function integrated over the domain. What I'll do is I'm gonna integrate by parts, the only term, which is this one that should be integrated by parts. And what I'll do is I'll write V on the left-hand side, the rest on the right-hand side, and I'll move L transpose here. So one of the differential operators will be moved to the left and I'll draw an error with M bold because it's, I need to consider when I integrate a surface, the curve that bounds a surface uh, is, we need to talk about that when we integrate our parts. So that's why you have to have an M bold because that defines a normal to the curve that encloses that area. So that's what we get. Uh, the bottom goes back into the integral, as you see there, you can see that here. L bold transpose V, C bold, L bold, U bold, right here. All that is written here. The minus times minus is plus, um, but everything else stays the same here on the left-hand side. Then I have the cross term. This cross term uh, is this one right here. Uh, you see V times C L bold, C bold, L bold, U bold times M bold, dot M bold. So that's the boundary term. Notice how L bold, U bold is strain bold and C bold and C strain bold is stress bold. And this is Couch's relationship. This allows you to relate the stresses at the boundary, the stresses inside the body to the boundary, the tractions of the boundary. So beautiful. We're able to uh, show that this equation can be simplified so that this t bold uh, superscript n, which means that uh, is acting at a location with a surface normal n. The integration of parts of an area gives you a curve that encloses the area. And that's why you see an integral here with respect to L dl, um, because dl is a line element of the curve that's enclosing that surface area A. So that's a weak form. That's a weak form right here in a compact manner. H is the thickness, is small, but I kept it there. You can cancel it out. Um, and V is a, is a weight function. So we're going to now approximate solution by selecting U bold to be an approximate solution that depends on the nodal unknowns, while we'll select V to be the shape functions, like we've been doing for a while. So let's choose V to be the basis functions and we substitute the approximation for U. So let's do that. Let's substitute the approximation for U. I have this UV and we have shape functions in one and two and three and so forth. Uh, you can see here that U can be approximated relative to the nodal unknowns. So you get N1 times U1 plus N2 times U2 plus N3 times U3. You can see that these are the nodal unknowns and the shape functions will do the job of serving as the basis functions, the trial functions um, in the weak form Galerian. game. U and V are the deflections within the body of material and Q bold are the nodal unknowns that we're looking for. So this becomes M bold, this is Q bold. And I'm going to take V and make it M bold transpose because I want to select V to be the shape functions. Um, and I will do then the, the substitution. So I will plug all this into here. Uh, this is the weak form of the, of the problem. Uh, you can see here U bold double dot when I plug in M bold Q bold becomes M bold transpose M bold Q bold double dot. Here, uh, we can now keep going. So V here is M bold transpose. You can see that there. 
C ball is that. L ball is this. U ball is M ball times Q ball. That's that. V is M ball transpose. V is M ball transpose. And now I'm ready to rewrite this in a way that's simple. Q ball, Q ball double dot can come outside of the integral. Q ball can come outside of the integral. And I'm basically done. This can go to the right hand side because it has no Q. And so now I'm ready to use a finite difference technique. But what we want to do is to determine an isoparametric formulation so we can quickly um, use the same shape functions for every element. We can integrate the domain over the same way for every element and so forth. So what you see here is we've already applied the weak form Galerik and this is what we got. Um, and so we can develop the isoparametric formulation by calculating the Jacobian. We have to calculate this Jacobian. That's needed. We know that. So we have to first define the nodal coordinates. Where are the nodes for this particular element? So that goes into this column here. The shape functions go here. And I'm going to use the same shape functions that I use for the approximation of the fields that are unknown. And I'm going to use that because I'm going to use them to then plug in the natural coordinates. That, and by the way, here uh, for a, as a quadrilateral, it will get mapped to a square. We already covered that. And so these ones go from minus one to one, each of these. So I will plug in the value of C and eta, and that will return a value of X and Y. So here you can see that N1, N2, N3, and so forth are defined in this matrix. So that's N bold, and then C bold contains the coordinates of that element. This can be plugged in here to get uh, the Jacobian. You can then cal calculate the Jacobian, which is unique for every element. So the parametric formulation, just like the 3D, will simplify greatly. So this integral now goes from minus one to one is a double integral because that's an area, dA. Earlier we had 3D, which is the volume. So it was a triple integral. Um, and the Jacobian helps me map it, take the dA, map it into this like that. Uh, we also have to calculate the B bold, uh, but this whole thing is easy. Uh, you know, the, the differential areas are easy to deal with. The subtractions are applied on the curve that encloses the area. It's a little bit harder, and we'll discuss that through an example. B bold requires the calculations of these derivatives, of these derivatives, I'm sorry. I covered that in 3D, so go back and check that out. But we have to calculate derivatives. I'll use the Jacobian, which I calculated in this step, to calculate these derivatives. Sorry, these derivatives are known. The Jacobian is known, so I should be able to calculate these derivatives because Ni does not depend on x and y. They only depend on c and eta. So I need a way of calculating these things, and I can do that by using the Jacobian. Invert the Jacobian like that. And this multiplication here allows you to get these values. This right here is what will get then substituted. Uh, well, once I get this value and this value, I can plug it in here, here, and here. And then this becomes the blocks that go in here. Again, we already derived this for 3D. All I'm trying to do is kind of remind you for 2D how you could do, do that. For triangular element, uh, you have to be more careful. The integrals go from um, r equals zero to one minus s and integral from s equals zero to s equals one. That's the only difference between quadrilateral, this quadrilateral element. So we turn the quadrilateral into a square and that's why we have a double integral from minus one to one. Here is a triangular element, right triangle. So you have to do the integral a little bit differently. Procedure is the same. Uh, now we're using the RNS coordinate system, uh, but th th the idea is the same at the end of the day. So there's a lot of element types, uh, two unknowns per nodes because I want to find the deflections at these nodes. 
all the element tests were discussed before, but I'll bring it up again. The first order triangular element has a node here, node here, node here. A second order triangular element has a node here, node here, and node here in addition to that. So there's 12 degrees of freedom. Here I have six in this particular one. We call this the constant strain triangle because the strains are constant in every element. And they're just numbers. The quadrilateral element, there's a first order quadrilateral element, four nodes, eight degrees of freedom. Obviously, all I need to calculate now for two of these U and V. And then there's serendipity element, which has eight nodes, 16 degrees of freedom. And we covered the bubble function in the previous lecture, Q9, shown on the right, which is nine nodes, 18 degrees of freedom. So with that said, I'll move, uh, I'll move to the very next lecture, which is to cover an example. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you next.